And it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Beatrice Colomina, who is Professor of Architecture, History and Theory, Director of the School of Architecture, and the Founding Director of the Program in Media and Modernity at Princeton University. She's the author of many publications, including Domesticity at War and Privacy and Publicity, Modern Architecture as Mass Media, which has been published in translation in eight languages and will soon appear in Turkish. Uh, Beatrice, as fully appointed out, curated with her students the exhibition Clip Stamp Fold, The Radical Architecture of Little Magazines, which was presented at Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York and Documenta 11, amongst other venues. Um, first, Beatrice will give her paper, then we will move to Shuda Sengupta. Um, there are, is a coffee break after questions before we move to Jody Dean. Lunch is very late today. If you've looked at the program and since we're already starting late, I would very much encourage you to profit from the snacks that are available at the coffee break. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for uh, your introduction and thank you very much uh, Fulia for Anne Maria and all of you for inviting me to be part of this uh, uh, wonderful event uh, of former West, which I didn't know anything about it, but of course I learned in the meantime quite a bit and I had an extraordinary day uh, yesterday. Uh, as Maria uh, pointed out yesterday, 1989 is not only the year of the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, but also uh, the year of something we didn't talk so much about, which is the launch of the uh, World Wide Web, right? basically the coming out of the World Wide Web. So I want to make a couple of uh, observations about these uh, two events as a way to frame uh, what I wanted to, uh, to talk about uh, today. It is important to understand, I think, that both events, the fall of the Wall of Berlin and the uh, beginning of the launch of the World Wide Web are architectural uh, events. The first one is obviously an architectural event. It's about a wall, in fact, about the loss of a wall and architecture, uh, you can say, is nothing but walls. Uh, the World Wide Web uh, is a space also. It's a kind of uh, horizontal uh, space. It's, it's not an accident that is called the World Wide Web and not the world, uh, I don't know, tall uh, uh, web. So it is also about a horizon. One is uh, uh, profoundly uh, physical and the other uh, is electronic, uh, a media event. But of course, as we will see uh, today, this distinction between physical and media is uh, really of no value. You can be in prison uh, by a physical uh, space, but also by an electronic uh, uh, wall. An architecture is always uh, negotiating between the physical and the media, has always been negotiating, at least since the beginning of the 20th century, between uh, the physical and the media. Architecture actually operates in the gap, uh, better probably is in the slippage, in, in the blur between the physical and media spaces. And the question of horizon is always uh, there. Architecture is creating a sense of the horizon. It's a way of framing uh, the wall of seeing. Uh, the war. So my paper, as Vivian uh, say, is, uh, is going to show how a particular media, the little magazines of the 1960s and 70s, that is in the years um, before 1989, allow architects to completely open up a new horizon, revolutionizing architectural responsibilities. So uh, it is important to understand in that sense that architects always use media to generate uh, new architectural uh, concepts. But of course, it's not just architects. You can say that really um, the first media to modernize, to have a modernizing effect was publications, and in particular uh, periodical pu publications, magazines, that the history of the avant-garde, not only in architecture, but in art, in literature, cannot be separa separated from the history of its engagement uh, with the media. And this is an important point because sometimes it gets lost, right? It's not that the avant-garde used the magazines to publicize work that already existed. The work did not exist before the publication. So you can say that the publication is a kind of a construction site, right? I'm going to go very quickly here because you know all of this very well, but futurism, but sometimes you need to insist that futurism did really not exist before uh, the publication of the manifesto uh, in Le Figaro. 
that Le Corbusier did not exist before the publication of his uh, uh, little magazine, L'Esprit Nouveau, between 1920 and 1925. He became an architect, he became known as an architect, he created a clientele uh, for his work, for his practice, precisely through the pages of L'Esprit Nouveau, which is also, by the way, the source of the famous books. If you never saw L'Esprit Nouveau, you definitely have seen Versin Architecture, right? Or so was a new architecture, and all the books that came out of this publication, also very modern, Le Corbusier, no? He produces a book out of uh, all the articles that have been published in the periodical uh, uh, magazine. But even more interesting, I mean, his name did not exist, right? The name Le Corbusier is a pseudonym that he invented to talk about architecture in L'Esprit Nouveau because there were all these other things that he was talking about, about uh, and he wanted to differentiate that. So he invented this pseudonym, and so you can see that Le Corbusier really, uh, very quickly, was an effect of, uh, of a little magazine. Even architects like Mies that we normally don't associate with the media, we think, we think about them in terms of marble and craft, tectonics, and I don't know, did not really exist uh, without G, uh, the journal that he was part of, and the many little magazines that he uh, covered his work, for example, Fruhrlicht, or Mirth, or so many others. And again, it's, I have to insist again that it's not just that we learn about the war of these architects through these magazines, but that the work was produced first and foremost for these magazines. Mies uh, will be my case study here for like uh, two minutes. His place in architectural history, his role as one of the founders of the modern movement was established precisely through a series of five projects, none of them built or really buildable, they were not uh, developed at that level. He could not have, even if he had given the commission, would not have been able to, to do it. He, he did, couldn't know how to do them. Yeah? But he produced these uh, images, these ideas for precisely uh, publications and exhibitions during the first half of the 20s, I'm talking about the glass skyscraper that you see here of 1922, another glass skyscraper, the Friestrasse skyscraper of 1921, the reinforced uh, concrete office building, uh, the uh, brick uh, uh, country house and the concrete ha country house, both of uh, uh, the concrete of 1923 and the brick of 1924. It was these uh, five projects, these uh, five paper architecture, together with the publicity apparatus enveloping them, that first made Mies into a historical figure. The houses that he had been so far, and that he will continue to build during the same years, would have taken him uh, nowhere. Uh, just so that you have a, a sense of what I'm talking about, because in fact, you can say that uh, in Mies, more than in any other architect of the modern movement, there is a, you can talk of a, a case of real schizophrenia between his uh, published uh, projects and the, those developed for actual clients. Still in the uh, 20s, at the same time that he was uh, able to develop has such radical designs as the glass skyscraper and the brick, uh, brick and, and, and concrete country houses, he uh, was able to do uh, this Villa Eichstatt uh, in 1923 in a suburb of Berlin, or even more scary, the Villa Mosler in Potsdam of 1924. And I have to insist, this is the kind of thing that historians of architecture tend to kind of hide on the side, like it's not happening, I, I don't see this contradiction, why will I see this contradiction? Right, so you have this kind of seamless history which really doesn't pay attention to what is happening. So, of course, we could always blame it on the client, right? but it doesn't quite work because Mosler was a banker and his house is supposed to have reflected uh, his taste. But when in 1924, eh, 24 is kind of late, right? He has done all these projects, he's already famous. Uh, the art historian and constructivist artist Walter Dexter, who was very much uh, interested in and supportive of modern architecture, commissioned Mies specifically to do a modern house for him, he practically uh, blew it. I mean, he couldn't come up with the modern house that his client desired, he kept uh, postponing the deadline and, and uh, the client in the end just gave up and gave the project to another architect. So you can say that for a long time, Mies was trying to catch up with his publications. Right? Um, 
All right. Um, so magazines, in, in that sense, acted as the construction site for the production of a whole new miss. In fact, the only miss uh, that we know today. So in the context of G, he could do the country uh, house. In the very same year, he could do this, these houses that you saw before. Uh, it's not just uh, a miss or Le Corbusier, but entire groups like uh, the steel or archigram uh, in the 60s became also an effect of uh, their journals. Uh, I will tell you a, a kind of a funny story, because I like funny stories, uh, of uh, that uh, Reiner Bangham, the famous uh, architectural critic of the 60s, told about how he used to live in front of Peter Cook, and one day he's there yeah, in the 60s walking the dog, and, and there is this limousine full of Japanese architects that uh, get off and ask him, do you know where is the office, the architectural office of Archigram? And, it's like there's no office of Archigram, right? And, but he knows that Peter Cook lives across the street and that Archigram is really this leaflet, this really this pamphlet that's been, that's been produced in the kitchen of Peter Cook, right? So it's only in retrospective that uh, this heterogeneous uh, group of, uh, of architects, David Green, Peter Cook, Ron Heron, uh, Mike Webb, decided to call themselves Archigram, to capitalize in what they have kind of inadvertently uh, 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 produced. So Ar Archigram, again, the group Archigram, uh, the architecture of Archigram is an effect also of the magazine. And of course, Archigram is uh, not just one instance of a broader phenomenon. During the 1960s and uh, 70s, uh, there was really an explosion of architectural little magazines which instigated a radical transformation in architectural culture. You can argue that during this period, little magazines, more than buildings, again, like in the 20s, were the site of real innovation and debate in architecture. Rainer uh, Banham could hardly contain his excitement. In an article entitled Soon Wave Hits Architecture of 1966, he throws away any kind of scholarly restraint to absorb the syncopated rhythms of the new magazine in a kind of futuristic ecstasy, and he writes, and you can read it there, one uh, soon rave, and it's not ready, steady, go, even if sometimes looks like it. The sound effects are produced by the erupting of underground architectural protest magazines. Architecture, a state queen mother of the arts, is no longer courted by plus glosses and cool scientific journals, but is having her skirts blown up and her bodies unzipped by irregular newcomers, which are typically rhetorical, with thick, moralistic, misspelled, improvisatory, anti-smooth, funny format, clicky, art-oriented, but stone out of their minds with science fiction images of an alternative architecture that will be perfectly possible tomorrow if only the universe were differently organized. Right? And it kind of uh, <laughs> it makes you nostalgic for a time in which an architectural critic will not only react to what is actually happening in front of his, uh, of his face, but react with this kind of freshness and uh, instead of the kind of more constipated architectural discourse that we uh, tend to have right now. Okay, so if little uh, magazines, and this is a very well-known phenomenon, really drove the historical avant-garde in the 1920s, and this is a, a phenomenon that has been studied extensively, and I'm just uh, passing images to remind you, there have been plenty of uh, reproductions and plenty of exhibitions on the steel, on Merth, on all these uh, magazines of the early avant and, 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 and many others, what people don't realize so much is that the 1960s and, and 70s witnessed a rebirth and transformation of this uh, 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 vehicle, the little magazines. New kind of uh, radical publication acted really as the engine uh, for the, the period, generating an astonishing variety and intensity of work. And while in recent years there had been a really huge interest in the experimental architecture of this period, there had been exhibitions on Archigram, the Metabolis, Amphorn, Super Studio, Archizum, uh, etc. The magazines that were really the engine of that revolution in architecture had been, for the most part, neglected. So the idea of the Clip Stand Fall uh, project, which started four years ago and is still ongoing, was uh, trying to present uh, uh, this exuberant moment about which there seemed to be now some kind of amnesia. Even the very protagonists, the, the architects and editors that were involved in the production of these magazines, seem to have forgotten how amazing that moment uh, was. 
For example, when the exhibition opened in New York in the fall of, um, of 2006, and these are some images of the exhibition uh, in New York after uh, uh, the opening is 2006, after three years of uh, intensive research, we have all these editors, Peter Kur, Bernard Chumi, Hans Kolein, Peter Eisman, Rosa and Kraus, coming to the gallery to give talks, and they all seem to be in some sort of shock. So uh, even themselves, they have forgotten how extraordinary the moment uh, it was. But the exhibition, of course, is not meant to be nostalgic, uh, even if these people in particular felt uh, that way. The idea was precisely to invite uh, reflection on contemporary uses of the media in architecture and to challenge uh, architects to produce a similar intensity. And again, more images of the exhibition in the storefront, which, as you see, the components are this wallpaper of uh, covers and the timeline that you see here with the and the bubbles that contain the originals and there is also the, the kind of speakers uh, because of course we went all over the world uh, interviewing the editors and the architects involved and fragments of these uh, uh, conversations are uh, uh, being here in the in the gallery the timeline and the timeline and the wallpaper uh, the bubbles Bubbles with the, and then, of course, we did also, how do you call that, facsimile, so that people could have their uh, magazines in their uh, hands. Uh, the, best, the first uh, intention of the project that Vivian said was uh, pedagogical. Uh, then, in many ways, it transcended that context, but uh, uh, the initial idea of the project was to try to find a new educational model where instead of having uh, PhD students from their first year working in isolation, some kind of obscure research that maybe uh, uh, nobody knows about it, they step in and maybe they are advisor, to take students in their first year and make them work uh, collaboratively and you work with them too in the research. But also very important, the research is oriented towards the production of something, whether it's a book, a conference, an exhibition uh, or a film. So the pedagogy the logical uh, aim is to simply, not simply to reflect on the different kinds of media, but to produce media, to learn about communication uh, but, uh, by communicating. So in that sense, the project was, of course, the collaboration with a, a group of PhD students uh, from Princeton, as Vivian uh, say. Uh, and the exhibition, as, as I say, was the outcome of all these years of research, seminars, workshops, symposiums, archival research, interviews, and visits with many uh, of these editors, more than 100 interviews all over the world. The design and the very fabrication and installation of the exhibition has also been part of our work. In that sense, it was kind of nice to see PSD students that are always pale and in the library kind of wielding uh, hammers and electric drills or, or putting up wallpaper, which I end up thinking that was a very good therapy for writer's blocks and other pathologies of um, scholars. No, seriously, I mean, you are really kind of, uh, you have those students and then you give them a hammer and maybe they forget about it and then they do something else, right? Um, maybe they, they aim the hammer to you, that could be a problem. Anyway, the key word here is, uh, is collaboration. The exhibition concentrates on a particular period and on a particular uh, type of magazine, little magazines in architecture, and it does some kind of forensic survey of all such magazines in all countries. Of course, it's, it's really imp an impossible project. We keep learning about new magazines uh, wherever we go. So our arch archive grows with every venue and the number of witnesses and interpretations escalates. If any anything, then the explosion of little magazines turn out to be much bigger than we ever uh, thought. In fact, what the research does is uh, build a new kind of archive, and from there the title of my, of my uh, talk, an archive that moves, an archive that grows, an archive that reacts to the people uh, that see it and absorbs their reactions. In that sense, for example, when we were in New York, we used the occasion to bring, uh, for example, the entire group that made oppositions, Peter Eisman, Kenneth Frantom, Tony Bidler, Mario Ganderson, Gandersonas, and uh, uh, of course we record uh, these conversations about the beginning of opposition and form part of our archives. It was so crowded, as you can see, that we are practically on top of them, right? All these are students, and we have to be a standing room only, right? And uh, again, another night we have uh, the entire group of October, Rosalind Krauss, Iba Lambois, Hal Forster, uh, and then we record the same thing. Another was the London Underground with people from uh, uh, Clip Kids, from Archigram, etc. 
Bernard Chumi, Stefano Boeri, Stephen Hall, eh, Alison Sky from Onside, Stephen Hall, Susan Stephen, Holland, uh, Hans Holine, Rem Kulhas, etc. Well, from there we went to, to Montreal, and again the same thing, it's a different situation, a museum, so we have to redesign the, the entire thing and uh, install it. And again, every time we go there, every time we mount it, every time we engage uh, with uh, other people there, every time we found new magazines in the places. For example, in Canada, there were a lot of magazines that we didn't know about. The same when we went to Documenta, uh, again, different space, uh, different uh, situation. Again, we do the design always ourselves. Always there is this newsletter, which has uh, fragments of, uh, of the interviews. We never go to a place with a ready-made exhibition. We always engage with the place, do more research, in this case, German magazines. Uh, 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 the same thing with the AA in London, where a lot of English and, of course, all, a lot of people were in London, so there was also a lot of uh, little talks. Uh, I'm reminded that in the meantime, we keep losing some of them, like Dennis uh, Sharp. So it was really very important to do this oral history uh, because uh, <coughs> In the process, uh, this is uh, Paul Virilio, uh, Cloparan, sorry, and with, with Paul Virilio did Architecture Principe, uh, Peter Murray, etc. And from there to Vancouver, and in Vancouver a lot of alternative magazines, and Oslo, same thing, uh, Northern European magazines that we didn't know about, uh, interviews with people that were already in their 80s, uh, Barcelona, again, Barcelona was also very interesting. I studied in Barcelona, I didn't know anything. Nobody seemed to know anything about magazines like La Mosca, that Boigas did even before the uh, architectural uh, piece. And also the archive of things that have happened in previous exhibitions, like the talks that happened in New York or in London, were then presented in the following exhibitions that you can see here in Barcelona, the videotapes of uh, London and New York and so on and so forth, right? All right, so very quickly. So what is uh, the term little magazine stand for? The term uh, is an Anglo-Saxon term. It doesn't exist in any uh, Romance uh, language. It was first used to describe precisely a small uh, avant-garde literary publication such as Margaret Anderson, uh, The Little Review of 1910s and, and the 19-teens and, and, and 20s. And they were dedicated to progressive theory, art and culture. Uh, they were set apart precisely from the are more professional periodicals by the are non-commercial operation and a small circulation. The term was then appropriated in architecture by Denise Scott Brown that in the 1970s wrote this article uh, called Little Magazines in Architecture precisely talking about uh, these uh, uh, magazines like Archigram and Clipkit that were emerging in architecture culture. Ourselves in the exhibition, we have used little magazines in architecture to refer to this kind of small circulation, self-published magazines, often difficult to obtain and produce with little or no support on kitchen tables and in the back uh, rooms of schools. Uh, magazines such as these, The Ghost and Times, Arnett, eh? Steve Farmer, Ars, Provo in the Netherlands, right? Circus, Melp. Uh, in flat cook book, Solomon Farm, and also other little kind of publications, for example, uh, the postcards of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Bernard Chumi, advertisements for architecture, um, etc. But also, you may have noticed already in the wallpaper, there were also big magazines such as AD, Casabella, Domus, and La Cité de And this is because we felt that uh, the little magazines have infected the big magazines during that period. Eh? So what has been a rather uh, conservative or, or, or traditional architectural magazine such as Casabella during those years, they transformed themselves into something else. Eh? Same thing with uh, AD. AD uh, during these years also uh, changes even the paper, changes the economy of the journal. It doesn't have advertisement. It becomes like a little uh, kind of counterculture uh, uh, magazine. I mean, here you have them going to, to California. They will go to the United States entirely past the, uh, the East Coast, they say, and they will go to where uh, the action was, in their opinion, which was in the West Coast with the bubbles and the, and the, and the domes and all the hippies and the drugs and all of this, right? So uh, Bao, likewise, it was a very kind of uh, 
traditional uh, architectural magazine organized by, uh, published by the Association of Architecture in Austria. And then Hans Holein one day complained to the editor what a lousy magazine this was. And he said, why don't you do it? And then, of course, he came out with this extraordinary uh, uh, journal during this period. And that is the reason why there are also big magazines like La Citur de Urdui, Bau, uh, this the first publications of uh, Rem Kurhas, etc. Okay, so what made uh, this explosion of little magazines possible? The rise of new and low-cost uh, printed technologies such as offset lithography in the early uh, 60s is of course of crucial importance to understand the publication of these little magazines because unlike traditional uh, letterpress printing offset lithography allow for the page to be prepared on the drawing board or on a kitchen table before of course you have to go to the printers and it was much more expensive so this is uh, very important to me because there is always a relation as we will see later between revolu revolutions and uh, technolo technology right uh, these innovative uh, and uh, energetic publications uh, help, I mean, in fact, you can say there is a relationship between the production of architectural concepts in these years and the different production uh, techniques used to create the publications uh, themselves, like Clip Kit, for example, which takes its name and its format from the concept of clip on architecture that was being promoted in its pages. Okay. So what is interesting about these magazines is that they, they form a global uh, network and exchange uh, among students and architects, but also between architects and other disciplines. They acted as incubators of new ways of thinking and a key arena in which the emerging problems facing architectural production could be debated. So this, uh, in pract practically you can say that all uh, the themes that preoccupy us today can be said to have emerged during these years. You have the phrase preoccupations with uh, recycling, with energy uh, responsibility, with cardboard architecture, emergency architecture, synthetic materials, digital, digital data flows, uh, global mobility. Uh, you see the first, uh, of course, oil crisis of the 1970s, the emergence of computers, of machine intelligence, polymers, uh, terrorism. So practically everything uh, that we are concerned with uh, today, you can see in the pages of these magazines and, and frankly think is the last time that architecture was uh, seriously thinking and that I, in many ways we uh, are now returning, going back uh, to this period and kind of uh, uh, retaking the, the threat of the uh, serious research that was done in the context of this magazine. Practically everything but architecture in the conventional sense of a building or an architect in the cover of a journal, which is what you see today everywhere, uh, is in these magazines. As Colline famously uh, put it in this uh, magazine, which you look like it's a building, but in fact it's a piece of cheese, which in fact is a joke, because in order to say that uh, a piece of cheese, a bad building is a piece of cheese, so that's why he puts this uh, piece of cheese uh, there. So as Colline famously claimed during this moment, everything is architecture, everything, uh, but architecture, in fact, is splashed in the covers of these uh, radical magazines in an orgy of intense and sophisticated uh, design. So, what do we learn uh, in these magazines? And very quickly, I'm going to go through uh, the four or five uh, 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 kind of clusters that we organize in the exhibition about the themes that emerge during this uh, period. I'm going very fast, but in fact, I have time. I don't know why <laughs> so fast. <laughs> <laughs> because yesterday everybody was late, so I thought to myself, I have to go really fast, but probably you're saying, what is he, what's he doing? Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll be early. So the themes are, are um, the space uh, program is really uh, one of the dominant themes that emerges in all, uh, worldwide is a preoccupation. So uh, the space program, you can say that is a catalyst for rethinking new social and architectural problems that is the mobilization of vastly expanded sense of scale uh, was counter precisely by miniaturization, the fascination with the new existence minimum of the uh, seal capsule and the space uh, uh, suit. 
Uh, cybernetics, of course, uh, cybernetics uh, can be defined as the study of communication and feedback control processes in biological, mechanical and, electron and electronic systems, with its emphasis upon the manipulation and creation of networks of information in parallel with the theories of McLuhan, cybernetics propel the substitution of information for material in architectural discourse. In other words, information becomes material for architecture during this uh, uh, period. And another thing that we can kind of keep returning uh, now. Uh, ecology. Ecological uh, concerns were also, also closely uh, tied to a rethinking of the condition of the house and its natural, urban and global uh, uh, economics. The house was reconceptualized in terms of whole earth systems, which entailed the recycling of both material and energy. So you find magazines, traditional magazines like Architecture and Casabella, and that is, they find themselves in, in, in kind of an incredible intimate dialogue with all these counterculture uh, magazines such as the Dome Books, the Whole Earth Catalog, uh, Shelter, etc. In fact, the Whole Earth Catalog writes about AD as one of the few magazines in architecture that one should really uh, read. And you can see this Street Farmer, the Whole Earth uh, Catalog, with, uh, and, and all of them, and they, as I say, they all uh, go back to... Well, okay, uh, fourth uh, theme, uh, May 68, and another civilian uh, protest and institutional uh, critiques, of course. Uh, uh, it's not just uh, May 68, but the emergence of various protest movements that developed around the globe in the 1960s, we tend to associate with, the, with 68, but maybe a, a less known is, is the parallel critiques that took place in the field of architecture, eh? uh, you know, they have uh, the struggles for the, uh, with the squatters, uh, this is uh, Prague, uh, again May 68, etc. There is also a huge, uh, um, the magazines become a, a very important vehicle for a reform in architectural uh, education. The students are really um, in a strike, uh, uh, they emphasizing the architectural object in favor of questions of uh, organization, urban sociology, participation, etc. So some of these magazines becomes the vehicle uh, for a student's demand for reform in architectural education. And all of this, you can say, belong to this, this period. And as I say, is worldwide. You find it as much as you find it in, in England, you find it in France, but you also find it in Mexico. Education and ideology, again, in Mexico, etc. All right. So, and uh, finally, uh, the uh, rise of uh, architectural uh, uh, theory. In the 1970s, you also see the rise of, uh, of uh, little magazines like uh, Contrapiano, in which certain architectural theories like Manfredo Tafuri start to, to participate, uh, uh, Angelos Novos, Obsid, and before we know, you have the emergence also of uh, what you can say are little magazines, little theory magazines in architecture and the emergence of uh, of what we call uh, now architectural uh, theory happens precisely in this uh, uh, context. These magazines often uh, model themselves uh, in the image of the avant-garde uh, journals of the 1920s and 30s. This happens again worldwide in France, in, in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, in the United States with oppositions, etc. As I say, these uh, magazines tend to uh, model themselves in the uh, magazines of the 20s and 30s. In fact, uh, um, for example, uh, uh, in Carrer de la Ciutat in Barcelona, we did a reprint of, uh, I was a student in Barcelona in those years, we did a reprint of Das Andere, that was also the model for our typeface, uh, form uh, published Mecano. So the magazines of the 60s and 70s have more of a historical consciousness. They understand they are the inheritors of that tradition. Mecano, etc. In fact, uh, Peter Eisman says when we interviewed him about how he started the opposition, he said he had always felt terrible about the fact that there was never, had been never an avant-garde, an architectural avant-garde in North America. And then starting to think about it, he realized that you, in order to have an avant-garde, you have to have a magazine. Uh, so <laughs> he thought that he could start opposition as a way to uh, organize uh, an, an, an architectural avant-garde uh, in the United States. But paradoxically, in fact, uh, uh, the avant-garde journals 
uh, were uh, really a new kind of history theory journal. So theory uh, was, in fact, the new avant-garde in the uh, United States. So, in conclusion, this network uh, system of little magazines became an intelligent in engine, a kind of alternative uh, uh, university. But the key point here is that its massive capacity is a direct pro product of how little these magazines were. Their fragility, even their ephem ephemerality, is very important. As Peter Cook put it in one of the interviews, no matter how repressive your school was, they couldn't prevent something from coming through you, the letterbox, right? So the letterbox is the vehicle through which most of those magazines are coming into the school and revolutionizing uh, pedagogy and architecture. The little magazine in the letterbox sustained an, an extraordinary intellectual capacity radically displacing the traditional uh, publications. Right. So what is uh, uh, happening uh, today, perhaps we can leave this uh, to uh, the discussion, but I just want to say very briefly that I think revolutions are always uh, tied to new communication uh, uh, technologies. In the 1960s and 70s, as we have seen, offset uh, uh, lithogra lithography made possible uh, these uh, publications, these uh, political uh, leaflets and little magazines in, in architecture. If you think about this, uh, uh, the Rodney King uh, riots in LA, uh, they demonstrated, I think, that at any one time somebody was with a video camera in the street and that, in fact, video uh, cameras could be used as a tool uh, for civilian defense uh, in the face of, uh, of the brutality of, uh, of the police. Uh, even uh, cell phones, I think you can talk about the incredible role that cell phones play uh, uh, during the 9-11 uh, 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 crisis as a tool precisely of uh, civilian defense. Yesterday we talked about 9-11 in uh, quite unexpected uh, uh, ways. I like also, uh, when I, I, I tell you the way I thought about it at that time. The, what struck me about 9-11 is the way in which in the middle of this spectacular event that was being, uh, uh, and I was living 200 meters from it, so let me tell you, I was there. Uh, uh, the, in, the, in the middle of all this uh, uh, a spectacular event being uh, broadcast all over the world, the towers falling all the time, all, you know, continuous repeating uh, to the point of numbness, the same uh, images. What nobody really uh, talked about was the fact that uh, the majority of people in an unprecedented situation in the history of any catastrophe were uh, exchanging the most intimate uh, uh, conversations with their loved ones, uh, saying goodbye, their last their last wars. So you have absolute extreme intimate uh, intimacy in the in the heart of the of the spectacle. Uh, today, of course, with the viral capacity of uh, text messages, uh, Twitter, etc., have a uh, speed and intensity to physical and uh, uh, legal uh, boundaries by the definition ch challenges an autocratic uh, state. Think about what happened in Iran uh, a, a summer ago. Uh, so in many ways, uh, I think we can talk about uh, how uh, this uh, uh, fact that 1989, uh, perhaps we can leave this for the discussion, how 1989 is the year of the World Wide Web and we find ourselves today with new forms of, uh, of, of communications. Uh, magazine comes in, 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 in from the World Magazine, which is an Arabic uh, word uh, meaning uh, storehouse uh, for explosives. So the original meaning of, uh, of magazine is the one, and the one that actually, by the way, shows up in the first, in, still in an Oxford uh, uh, dictionary, is a store uh, for explosives, uh, for weapons. Uh, soldiers in Iraq, you have read that in the press, had been uploading uh, their videos of war on YouTube and WikiLeaks. If World War, war, uh, World war I was the first uh, media uh, war, uh, the Battle of Le Mans, Le Mans is supposed to have been won uh, by Coupe de Telephone, uh, the Vietnam War is the first uh, televised uh, war, and I think uh, 
Iraq is the first internet uh, war, in the sense that Iraq, uh, journalists are no longer the first ones to report, not the most uh, captivating at all. Think about a blogger like Riverbend, a young uh, Iraqi uh, woman who from uh, 19, uh, no, 2002 to 2007, when her family moved in exasperation uh, to Syria, reported uh, uh, the day-to-day -day life uh, in Iraq in a, in a blog uh, called Baghdad uh, Burning. Eh? Or think about uh, uh, CBFTW, called the battle, uh, fact the war, the first uh, 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 hand account of war in a blog by an American uh, soldier posted in, uh, in Iraq in 2004. The blog lasted only a few weeks when the army made him uh, close it, but these blogs uh, have told us more about the war than any other form of media. I mean, can we expect uh, architecture to be uh, far behind, to be sure nothing uh, of this uh, level of innovation and creativ creativity has happened yet in architectural blogs, but uh, when they do architectural uh, magazines, architectural pro publications, uh, uh, will have to change. So, in, in, in essence, the audience is now itself the journalists, uh, uh, the artists, soldiers in Iraq shoot and edit their videos, they add music uh, to them. Riverbend uh, blogs have been published in a book which was then translated into many languages that won liter literature and journalistic uh, prizes. Uh, so it has been also dramatized in, in several places. Uh, Coldly, uh, Bothwell uh, published his, book, his, his blog as a book and became a writer for Esquire magazine. So in short, new media occupies uh, and transforms all uh, media. The internet fits new ways of new kinds of journalism, new kinds of literature, new forms of theater, new kinds of video art, and again, uh, can architecture, uh, since this is my field, be far uh, behind. Thank you very much.